we are going to give y'all some biggest winners and losers of the nba off season okay and um zay if you want to start us off just give us a winner and then we'll go around and then we give a loser and then we go like that so zay you up for the winner all right, so my first uh, winner that I have this offseason, I believe, was um, the Orlando Magics. I thought the Magics did a fantastic job retaining their free, um, their players, the young players, on um, team-friendly contracts, um, uh, still creating the, the youth movement in Orlando um, that allows them to play as um, physical and as fast as they do, as well as adding in a veteran shooter, and uh, Catavius Caldwell Pope, aka KCP, aka NBA champion KCP, two time NBA champion KCP. So I think it, it was great that they brought him in. That veteran, that veteran marksmanship that he brings to that team allows them to see the, the, the court a little differently. And now allow guys like Paolo, guys like Franz, that open shooter, that open kick out when they're looking to drive into the paint. Um, a lot of times we saw in that playoff series against Cavaliers, there was a, um open guys, they couldn't make shots though. There were wide open threes, couldn't make a, a lick wide open. I'm talking about between Paolo, between Wendell Carter, between Franz, Jalen Suggs, and, and the list goes on and on. Guys could not make open threes. And instead of removing those guys or trading those guys to try to get some shooters, they were able to snag KCP, which was a fantastic get for them. So I believe the Orlando Magics uh, were one of the winners of the NBA Hall season by able to bring in a different skill set that they can utilize heavily throughout this season. Yeah, I would like to get my team. I'm going to go with the OKC Thunder as my number one. I think when you swap out a liability in Josh Giddy for a guy like Alex Caruso and not even having to attach a draft pick compensation in the deal, you get a one for one. You stole. OK, you just rob a franchise with no gun. And um, he's one of the best defensive players in the league. And you add him to a already stout, you know, uh, defensive team. I mean, you got Lou Dort over there. Think about that matchup and how that's going to look. And then on top of that, you sign, unfortunately, as Knicks fans, we all are here on the show, Isaiah Hartenstein, one of the best backup bigs in the league. You know, and you give Chet Holmgren some help because, you know, he's a good player, obviously, but and he's a good rim protector and all that. But, you know, going up against Joel Embiid, going up against Jokic, you know, you're going to manhandle this guy. So you get a guy in Hartenstein that could kind of like help him out defensively and, and kind of give him some assistance there. That's a very good pickup. And I think the way how the Thunder is built right now, you have great perimeter defense. You have the rim protection. You have the MVP in Shea. They kind of remind me, and this may be bold, but hear me out. They remind me of the Celtics right now because they have the versatility and the stars, right? So, for example, the Celtics, you got Tatum, you got – Brown. Well, you have that in OKC, right? With um Shea and, and you got the other guy. Um, the thing is Jalen Williams. Okay, you you got your two over there, and then you got your your big that reminds me of you know in some ways of KP and, and Chet Holmgren, a guy that can space the floor, um seven foot, you know rim protection, etc. You got that over there, and then you got your Drew Holiday and and um Caruso and Dort. You got two Drew Holidays over there. Listen, I think OKC right now should be the clear-cut favorite to come out of the Western Conference this upcoming season. And you have to attribute that not only to the momentum that they built last year, but how they capped off this offseason. All right. I will give my winner, and then um, I have some comments on what you guys had to say. So um, I'll start off by saying this. I know that the NBA era of big threes in recent memory has failed, right? It's not 2010 anymore. Thinking about the Brooklyn Nets not even getting to a conference final with uh, Durant, Kyrie, and, and Harden, and the Suns with Booker, Durant, and Beal, they got swept in the first round. But um, I think this Philadelphia 76ers team is set up for a much different result, and I think they're my biggest winners of the offseason because their new big three of Joel Embiid, Tyrese Maxey, and Paul George, I think they fit really well together. And that Knicks-Sixers playoff series last year – I thought it was the best series of the entire playoffs, like the playoffs peaked in the first round. I also think that series was decided by just a handful of plays that if they would have went differently here and there, we could have had an entirely different result in that series. And one thing that stood out to me when watching the Sixers was they just didn't have enough depth. They didn't have enough dudes around the pair of Tyrese Maxey and Joel Embiid. And I think now they do. And uh, I'm going to do something that I haven't done a ton of on this show. And 
Lil knows deep down how much crap I've given this guy over the years, but I have to give Daryl Morey some credit. The, like he tur- <laughs> the NBA's version of Mike McCarthy, he turned Ben Simmons into James Harden. And I know the James Harden era in Philadelphia did not work out. It was a disappointment. But then he was able to flip James Harden to the Clippers. And in return, he got two first round picks, two second round picks. And that deal also freed up the cap space for them to get Paul George. I also thought he signed some good depth pieces like uh, Andre Drummond and Eric Gordon. I think both those guys are going to play key roles for the Sixers this season. And I absolutely love the draft pick of Jared McCain from Duke. I think he was an absolute steal with the number 16 pick in the draft. And I think he's going to play some big time minutes and be a big time shooter for Philadelphia this season. I also want to give some credit to Joel Embiid. He was able to recruit Paul George to move across the country and spend the entire rest of his basketball prime in Philadelphia. I really didn't think that was possible for him to do. I thought the fact that Embiid was literally at the NBA finals and he sees Paul George sitting there at the NBA countdown table and walked over to them and said, you know what? I'm getting on this TV set next to Stephen A. Smith and I'm going to convince Paul George to come to Philadelphia. That was a total surprise. That was impromptu. It wasn't planned. Like Embiid was wearing sweatpants on national TV and he decided to go on set and recruit Paul George to Philly. And that told me that maybe, just maybe, this could be a sign that Joel Embiid, for the first time in his career, the number one priority for him is actually winning a championship. I don't think that's really been something that's been the case recently. And I'll end by saying this. I think Paul George is going to be motivated. He's really been in the NBA wilderness since he left Indiana looking for that championship. And he hasn't really been able to find a true home. And I think Philadelphia is going to provide him with that. And they're going to have some playoff success. Again, I I just thought he wanted to stay on the West Coast with the Clippers team that was going nowhere. He's comfortable in LA, but I think he picked a great spot. And there's really no other third option in the NBA right now that I think is better than Paul George. So I'm going to label Daryl Morey and the Sixers as my biggest winner of the offseason. All right, since we're done with the first lap, obviously we're going to give another winner. Anybody has anything to say about the three teams that we pushed out so far? Feel free to jump in. Zach, if you want to go. Yeah, sure. I, I, I like what Zay had to say about the Magic. I think when you're ranking teams in the NBA with the best future, and I think I said this a couple weeks back when you spoke about the Pacers and what exactly their future holds, I'm super high on this Magic team. I would have them right at the top of the list in terms of best futures in the Eastern Conference. I think Ben Caro is a star. He's going to be a top 10 player in this league sooner rather than later. Uh, Franz Wagner, quality piece. Uh, I think Caldwell Pope fits in perfectly. He'll bring and help to that winning culture. The Magic are also one of the best defensive teams in the league. I think their coach, Jamal Mosley, has a lot to do with that. I'm a big fan of him, and I'm a big fan of uh, this Orlando team of the future. And uh, with OKC, man, there's no doubt they got better. Swapping uh, Giddy for Caruso is an upgrade. I think Hartenstein is big because as good as Chet Holmgren is, they just needed a true five, even in that uh, playoff series against Dallas, like Lively and and Gafford ate him for lunch, and and they had no real choice. Uh, They couldn't stop him. So I like what both you guys had to say. I I think those were two good picks. All right. We're going to go to the next winner here. But um, my winner is actually not going to be a team is going to be a player. I'm going to go with Clay Thompson and I'm going to explain why I chose Clay Thompson over the Mavericks and why I went player instead of team. I'm going to break it from both sides. Now, I think when you're Clay Thompson, it's literally right in front of you. You have an opportunity and you took the opportunity to leave a sinking ship, which the Warriors are right now. They're going in the opposite direction and go to a team fresh off an NBA finals visit. And you get $50 million. You don't got to pay taxes. Okay. You get your rest of the snipes on. You don't got to pay it. Okay. And then you got Kyrie Irving and you got Luka Dantich. And really all you have to do is shoot, you know, and knock down your threes and try to stay in front of your, 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 um, you know, stay in front of your guy. And, and that's the best, you know, that you could do that. That's the American dream right there. And, and try to compete for a championship. But I think for me, the reason why I went Clay Thompson and I didn't go, The Mavericks is because looking at it from the flip perspective, I'm not sure what this move does to solve any of their issues, primarily defensively. They don't really have, they didn't have a guy 
that can just at the point of attack stop Boston with their actions on the perimeter. They didn't have that type of dude. You know, their best player defensively, arguably, was Derrick Jones. He left. So when you talk about Clay Thompson and what he's going to be required to do with a starting lineup of below average defenders in Kyrie Irving and Luka Dantage, you're banking on Clay giving you some type of version defensively up before, which is clearly gone. You know, clearly his legs is gone, and clearly he had uh, trouble staying in front of his man at various points. Now, I don't think his defense is bad. Don't get me wrong. I still think it's okay, but it's clearly not the same clay that it was before the injuries. And I think you're going to have to have some type of version of that to justify your defensive liable lineup. You know, I still like P.J. Washington and, and um, obviously the big fella up front, I believe Lively or Gaffley, one of those guys going to start. You know, they've been mixing and matching both of those guys. I like that. But, you know, just looking at it from that perspective and then the flip offensively, you know, the Warriors move around a lot. You know, they 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 use a lot of motion and they always move and Clay was always moving. Now he's just going to be sitting there in the corner, standing while Kyrie Irving dribbling, while Luka is dribbling the shot clock. And Clay is a rhythm guy. So I'm not sure how much of a rhythm he's going to be in. So I think for me, the big winner is him individually because he gets the bag. He gets a opportunity to leave a sinking ship and compete for a championship. And he gets to play with two great players and Luka Dantich and Kyrie Irving. Yeah, well, I'll respond to that. It's funny. I actually had the Mavericks as my second winner as a team right behind the Sixers, and I'll tell you why. I just think overall, they replaced Tim Hardaway Jr., Derek Jones Jr., and Josh Green with Klay Thompson, Najee Marshall, and Quinn and Grimes. I think the three guys they got are a pretty big upgrade in totality over the three guys they let go. And I think these moves make Dallas as a team better than they were last season, despite the fact that they got to the NBA Finals. And I know they really never stood a chance in that series. Boston kind of outclassed them. But I still trust Luka Doncic more than any other player in the league right now in the playoffs. I think he's going to use what happened in those finals uh, against Boston as a learning experience. And I also think Kyrie Irving deserves credit, kind of like Embiid, for recruiting Clay to Dallas. I don't think that moves hap- that move happens without Kyrie uh, playing a part and it's clear that Kyrie is all in on Dallas. He loves it there, and it's a great fit. And, uh, Will, I'm actually going to go back to something you said when you spoke about the Thunder uh, and them being the clear-cut favorite in the Western Conference. I disagree. I still think that Dallas is better. Like, when they played in the playoffs last year, Dallas beat them in six games, and honestly, they should have beaten them in five games. They had a double-digit lead in game number four of that series at home and, and choked it away. They had no business losing, and I know that OKC got better, but I think Dallas got better as well. I look at the rest of the conference. I think Denver is continuing to get worse. They lose KCP. I need to see them develop some young players around Jokic and Murray. I love the Robert Dillingham pick for the Timberwolves, but until they move off Carl Anthony Towns, I don't really take them that seriously as a title contender, and Dallas smoked them. And then I'll finally say I agree with, Will, your point about Clay Thompson for turning down the circus show that is the Lakers deciding not to come back to the Warriors and join this Dallas team, because I think if he wants to win another title, this is his best place to do it. I know that he's not the same player he once was in Golden State, but I still think he has a lot left in the tank. I think this is a perfect fit for him, and I think the Mavericks are much improved. I think Clay's going to make an impact. I love their offseason, and they were right behind Philadelphia for me as the biggest winner. Real quickly, I do want to respond to that real quickly because I think you made some very valid points. And I think if you were to look at the Mavericks, I think it's like give and take, kind of like lateral in a sense, because I think we are underestimating Derrick Jones and that departure. That's a guy that gave you athleticism, a guy that was part of that lob crew where you get the lobs and, you you know, obviously they fed off of that, you know, those plays to get involved. And I think when you look at his defense on guys like Paul George in the Clippers series, I actually thought he held his own. So the fact that you don't have that play, that was arguably your best defender on the team. I think you're losing something, even if the Quentin Grimes, you know, pick of which I like. And um, I forgot the other dude. Najee Marshall. I think that, I defensively, think, that, that's a good that's a good pickup. I think it's kind of I mean. like a lateral, a lateral type of thing for me. But you know, you could look at it from a perspective. I'll respond to that quickly and then I'll throw it to Zay like I like selling high on Derrick Jones Jr. when they did like he was obviously a very helpful productive player but I don't like 
you're literally buying him at his highest point. I like letting him walk for a guy like Marshall uh, for less money. I think Marshall's a very good defender. I think he's a little bit more versatile offensively as well. Quinn and Grimes is a good defender. And uh, this dude, Nico Harrison, the Mavericks GM, he's a wizard. Like if you look at the roster of Dallas when he first got there compared to what it is right now, it's night and day. I wasn't even too high on him when he made the Kyrie trade, but clearly that's a trade that's worked out. Clearly that was the first real game changing move he made and it got them to the conf- uh, the NBA finals. And again, I just think Doncic, he's going to uh, use what happened last year, getting to the finals uh, with that team as an exper- uh, a learning experience. I still don't trust anyone in the NBA in the playoffs more than I do him. And uh, I think this team should be the favorite in the West. I, I, th- I love their off season and I love what Harrison did. I think big that question. Was- I want you to respond to that question, not to throw you off track here, but I said OKC is my favorite in the Western Conference. You heard you heard Zach. He believes it's the Mavericks. Who do you think should, you know, just quickly, obviously that's not a major topic right now, but if you want to respond to that real quick. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I always say the role players um, are the ones that win the playoff games. I think the, from a depth perspective, I'll give it to Dallas because I am a firm believer in Quentin Grimes. I've been saying it for a while now, even at post Knicks. I think I've, I said it when he was on the Knicks that he could, um, his ceiling could be uh, a poor man's Clay Thompson. And ironically, they're on the same team. And I think he's going to learn a lot from Clay Thompson in terms of shooting the ball. Najee Marshall, I'm a huge fan of. He's a great defender and a guy who shoots threes. I think at, if you could say anything, he might be an upgrade to Derrick Jones Jr. because his ability to shoot threes is remarkable and his ability to defend is, a, is extremely at a high level coming from that Pelicans team who had a, nothing but wings who defended, who were not named Brandon Ingram. So I think the Mavericks have the opportunity, and I think that's why um, I wasn't I, I, I was going to use the Dallas Mavericks as my third, uh, my second uh, uh, winner, but they have um, upgraded tremendously um, in terms of shooting. They got rid of Tim Hardaway Jr. They brought in Quinn Grimes. They got rid of, uh, not got rid of, they couldn't re-sign Derrick Jones Jr. They, re- they signed in Anaji Marshall, guys who shoot threes and space the floor, something they were missing desperately in that Boston Celtics series, guys who can make threes at a high clip. So I think that team will do phenomenally well, and they should be the favorites in the West to, to win out. Um, the team that I had winning, um, the, my second winner of the um, offseason was the Pelicans. They brought in DeJounte Murray, a, a playmaker. They were desperately missing for a very long time. This Pelicans team was missing a point guard. They brought in CJ McCollum as if he was the playmaker on the Trailblazers. He's not a playmaker. He's more of a scorer. He's more to look for his basket first. I think now we bring in a guy who knows how to handle the ball, who also plays defense at the at the point guard position, allows CJ McCollum to go back to his natural um, position, natural form, which is scoring, which is going out there and trying to get buckets. Allows guys like Trey Murphy and Herb Jones to score. Allows guys like Zion to do what he does best and score baskets. I think DeJounte Murray is going to allow guys to be less um, pressured, to do something on offense, to do something outside of their skill set. And I think he brings that um, – tenacity to that team i know they lost um valentunas but he even him was departing away from that offense for the pelicans for quite some time and he's not much of a defender himself he's a huge body he could do a lot he's very physical but they were phasing him out on that team and the reports are right now that brandon ingram is going between the kings and the utah jazz so it's interesting to see what happens there in terms of what they get in return for Brandon Ingram. So I think right now the Pelicans are impressing me with their offseason thus far. I just wanted to say, and if this team is under anyone's losers, I'd be shocked if they are. But uh, I just wanted to say two quick points. Number one, a third team that I didn't have as much on, but a a team that I wanted to mention that I I think should be right up there with the winners is the Cleveland Cavaliers. I love uh, the hiring of Kenny Atkinson. I think that's a huge upgrade over uh, J.B. Bickerstaff. The fact that they convinced Donovan Mitchell to stay in Cleveland long term is unreal like I I didn't know if they were able to pull it off somehow they did I think they're one move away and that's probably trading Darius Garland I don't really know who the right team for that is or where the best fit is for him but uh I think building around Mitchell and Mobley and Jared Allen with Kenny Atkinson I also love the draft pick of Jalen Tyson from Cal that's a name to remember I think Cleveland is right there and I don't want to open a complete new rabbit hole, like a new door. But uh, I, 
and I know you guys did a whole segment on this last week, but like this is my first time on the show since the Knicks uh, made the big move for Mikael Bridges, and I want to know your guys' thoughts on that, and and uh, if they were uh, anywhere close to to being your guys' uh, off season winner after that move, because I have some thoughts on it. Oh, absolutely. I, I thought they were. I thought they was winners off the rip once they made that trade for Mikael Bridges. That was the only player I wanted the Knicks to go after and get was Mikael Bridges. The picks I didn't really care about. You know why? Because the Knicks don't use their picks regardless. They hoarded all the picks to trade for somebody. And people wanted Joel Embiid, Antonio Kumpo, Doncic, all these names that nobody was going to give up for the Knicks draft picks. The Knicks draft picks are literally to 25th in a draft. Like, that, those are not lottery picks you're getting. And um, getting Mikel Bridges shows that the Knicks are serious about their window of winning a championship. It's a two, two to three year window that's, a, that's been open since last season. And you have an opportunity to win a championship. So this is a time to take it. This team isn't going to get any better than the version we are seeing it right now. This is the best version of the Knicks team you could argue ever. And this is where it is right now. You can't, there's not a better team than this team right here. So it's not going to get better than this. You're going all in. This is the window. If it doesn't happen now, it's not going to happen for another 100 years. And that's just the truth of the matter. So you went out there, you traded the picks. I thought they they are a winner of the offseason off the strength that they went with their gut and they made they pulled off a big move. Yeah, I agree. And I'm going to keep my take short because we obviously ran over that topic on the last show or the two shows ago. I just think for us, we have to take advantage of that opportunity. And I understand you look at OJ and Anobi's contract, and uh, maybe my take is not going to be so short, but I'm going to try to make it short. Uh, when you look at OJ and Anobi's contract, um, $212 million. I understand a lot of people, you know, is looking at that like, huh? You know, um, but at the same time, as much as you could look at that contract, as much as you could look at what we gave up compensation wise for a guy in Mikel Bridges, you do have to realize that it's a window that we have right now that we have to try to, you know, compete right now and take that opportunity. It's, yeah, it's scary because, you know, you never know. OJ Anobi has an injury history. Clearly, that was a norm before he got to the Knicks. And clearly that was the case when he got to the Knicks at you know, towards the end of the season. But at the same time, as scary as it could be about, oh, what if, you know, the Mikael Bridges trade bombs, which I don't see how that bombs, but if it were to, or the OG, we can't really think from that perspective, that negative, you know, perspective. We have to look at, like, listen, we have a window. Jalen Brunson is in his prime. He clearly is our guy. Julius Randle is going to be our number two. We have to do all the things we can do right now to try to win a championship. And I think we've given us an opportunity to do that. So I think the trade was a very good trade, barring that it actually goes through. Because right now, what I'm hearing is that it's not official yet. And that kind of worries me a little bit because I'm hearing something about Deuce McBride you know, being in the deal or not, which I don't think we should want to give up Deuce McBride. That guy's a young stud who I think we should definitely be keeping out of this deal. So I'm a little worried about that. Yeah, I think it's just because the league, the new league year hasn't officially started yet, right? So like once the, that does. I, I think it's something where I read it last night where it's like something cap wise that there has to be another player in a deal. I forgot the terminologies and the specifics, but it's something to do with that. All right, I'll run through my quick uh, take on this trade. So I like the deal for the Knicks. I remember I said on this show, I think it was the first time we recorded after the Knicks lost uh, Game 7 to the Pacers, that Bridges need, needed to be the number one target for the Knicks this offseason. But I do have a slight concern about this deal. The Knicks, we know, they gave up all those first-round picks to the Nets, all their future assets. And that's usually only something you do when you're 1,000% sure that the guy you're getting is going to be the final piece of the championship team. And the Knicks making this deal for Bridges, it reminds me a lot of the Timberwolves deal with the Jazz for Rudy Gobert because the Wolves made that deal really exclusively building their team to stop Jokic and the Nuggets, and it worked, right? That team with their depth and their size in the front court was built in a lab to beat Denver, and they did that. And I think the Knicks are doing the same thing but with the Celtics. They're building their team to beat Boston, and while that could be possible after this deal, what happens if after this deal they're a piece or two short of winning a championship? You know, what happens if a guy like Giannis Antetokounmpo gets upset in Milwaukee and he asks out? Like, the Knicks have no assets to get that guy. And I also think uh, we hit on this earlier, Will, when you spoke about the Thunder. Like, the loss of Hartenstein, I think, is massive. I would have much rather 
somehow found a way to trade Mitchell Robinson, maybe trade Julius Randle, and make room for Hardenstein to stay. I think right now, backup center is a huge void, especially if Mitchell Robinson can't stay healthy, which, to be honest, he's had a lot of trouble doing that. Now, I've seen some possible reports for a possible uh, trade with Utah for Walker Kessler. I think that would be huge. And if the Knicks and Leon Rose were to somehow pull that off, that would be a game-changing move that I think would make them right there with Philly and Dallas as the biggest winners of this offseason for me. But I just think they're one body short in the front court right now. And to be honest, I still think they need to trade Julius Randle. I don't really know where he fits within this team. And I thought originally that the only way for them to get bridges would be to trade Randle in that deal. But somehow with all of the draft picks, they were able to still find a way to get bridges without him. So I'm just not really sure where Randall fits in with this team right now. And I still think they're one move away, especially in that front court. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we could end off there. I think that move in the front court is needed for depth. You know, Mitchell Robinson's history, um, injury history, being injury prone, not playing a lot of regular season games in the last couple of years, especially last year. So I think getting that that piece in the front court will be a move that we have to pinpoint on the board. This is what we need to do. So, um, yeah, I think there's risk in the deal, like I said before. But as I said in my take, I'm thinking about the positive and, and thinking about the window that we have and not trying to look at what potential superstar may request a trade. I don't think that's a good way to run your basketball team. Oh, let's wait and keep all these picks and wait for Giannis to get unhappy. Or let's wait for Joel Embiid to get unhappy. Yeah, they may get unhappy and they will look and be like, oh, yeah, we could have waited. But at the end of the day, we don't know if they're not. We saw what the 76ers did and who they added. I'm pretty sure Embiid is going to continue to be there for the next couple of years. Giannis may be a different story. Who knows? But I don't think that's a good way to run your team is waiting on a superstar to be unhappy, even though we all know it's the NBA. So they just better hope Bridges is, is that final piece because yeah, I if agree. He's, if he's not, they're in trouble. But yes, I want to go to the losers here and I want to give this team because I, I know there's going to be a team that is going to come up and, and obviously it should come up. But I'm going to go this route real quickly. I'm going to go with the Nuggets as my loser. And they may not be number one, obviously. There is a clear number one here for me, but I'm not going to go there. I'm pretty sure we're going to talk about that team. They'll definitely be right up there, number two for me. And the main reason why is that they lose one of their best point of attack defenders in KCP, a guy that I thought played very complimentary to that two-man game of Jamal Murray and Jokic, being able to obviously cut to the basket for open layup, being able to shoot the ball and defend at a at a, at a high level. And um, you already subtracted from that team a year ago when you lost Jeff Green and Bruce Brown. And a lot of people thought that was the main culprit, not having that depth of why you lost in the playoffs and now you just lose another valuable piece who was probably your best bench player in um Kadavius Pope who's now going to the Magic and I think Denver who lost in the second round of the playoffs to a team that was built in the lab to beat them I think they just lost another significant piece we all know KCP everywhere he goes the team improves we saw it with the Lakers he won the championship he doesn't get a lot of credit for his contributions to that Lakers championship run um, obviously what he did with Denver, we have to give him credit for that. And now he's going to a magic team that desperately needs him and what he can offer. And he's going to make them better. Obviously Zach on the mic saying that he believes the magic is going to be, uh, the, the brightest future type team. Well, guess what? Guess who he left the nuggets who obviously took a step back this year. So even my number two loser for me right now. Uh, for me, I think Zach used to call them their winners. I, I, I'm calling the Philadelphia 76ers losers, and I know they signed a max contract in Paul George, um, but I don't like the fact, I never like the fact of having three isolation star players on the same team. Um, Paul George, as we know it in his career, he's never delegated in his career. He's always a me guy. I need the ball. I need the score. I need to have the last shot. Um, he, he said that in Indiana. He said that in OKC. He said that um, in the Clippers, and he's saying it now again in Philly, and I was not a fan of him going to Philly and taking over the spotlight from Tyrese Maxey, who just had a career year and who should be only elevating his game. I don't think Paul George increases what um, Tyrese Maxey is capable of doing on the basketball court. I think he decreases his role on the offense, which is only going to hinder his stats, which is only going to hinder the team from winning because when Tyrese Maxey is going off, the team is winning. 
is not when Joel Embiid is going for 50 and 60. It's when Tyrese Maxey is having that production because he impacts winning basketball. And I think um, when you add Paul George to this mix, yeah, he's a great defender. Yeah, he's a great scorer. But I don't think he's coming here to be a third scoring option. I don't think he's coming here to be a complementary piece to Tyrese Maxey and Joel Embiid. And then when you talk about what they have around them, there's not much better. You have Kelly Oubre, you have Eric Gordon, Eric Gordon, and Andre Drummond around them, and that's the depth of the team. I'm not expecting this team to go far in the playoff or even make a deep playoff push with those as your complementary pieces around your star players. It didn't work last year. It didn't work the year before. Why do you think it's going to work now when the East is only getting better? So I, I from one, I think Philly should have prioritized adding more crucial de- um, role players to this team. If they could have got Alex Caruso the way OKC got Alex Caruso, they should have went out there and get him. If they could have paid KCP $22 million a year, they should have got went out there and got him. Like, there's guys they could have went out there and get, shoot, even trying to get Clay Thompson, a guy who's known for spot-up shooting. But they decided to go after a third isolation basketball player in hopes that this guy takes him over the hump over the Boston Celtics, Milwaukee Bucks, New York Knicks, Cavaliers, the Pacers are, are now here. And, shoot, let's even talk about the Orlando Magics. Are they even better than them in terms of playing team defense? And score? I don't even know that. So the Philadelphia 76 and Darren Moore once again have shown us they're all about me, all about the big names, all about the bright lights, but have nothing to show for it when it comes down to the playoffs. So that's why I call them one of the biggest losers um, of, the, of this offseason. But say when, when you watch them play the Knicks last year, you would admit like they were close. Like that series was really a toss up series that could have gone either way. And I think the moves they made this offseason makes their roster significantly better. And I believe in their coach. Like Nick Nurse is a total game changer here. This is not Doc Rivers running the Sixers. This is not Brett Brown running the Sixers. And I do think Paul George, like, again, I never thought Paul George would go to Philly. But the fact that Embiid was able to convince him, a true West Coast guy that I thought was all about L.A., all about living there. Uh, He grew up uh, on the West Coast. We know, uh, again, I thought he was going to stay there for the rest of his career. He decides to move across the country to Philadelphia. And I just think that big three of Embiid, Maxi, and George, I know you could say they're all isolation players, but I think they fit together really well. You have a big man in Embiid. You have a guard in Maxi who loves to create his own shot. I think he's a star in the making. And Paul George is your number three. Like, there aren't a lot of number three guys better in the league right now. I also think they have young players who could really make a jump, like a Ricky Council, like a Jared McCain I mentioned earlier. And I think there's a chance they could add one more piece, maybe a shooter like Gary Trent, who played for Nick Nurse in Philadelphia. I think that would be – or in Toronto. I think that would be a great fit. And although I've been very skeptical of Philly in the past, and I've criticized Daryl Morey a ton, I think he did a great job this offseason, and there weren't really that many other guys – uh, besides Paul George, that they really could have added that really moves the needle. Yes. I, I want to respond to that so real quick. quick. I want to ask, I wanna ask I, I, last question we respond. So if the Knicks well, – let's go back to what you said about the Knicks and Philly series. If the Knicks were fully healthy and Philly was fully healthy, do you believe the the Sixers would have beat the Knicks fully healthy? I'm talking about everyone that was hurt that's fully healthy, ready to play, and versus the Philadelphia 76 that last, um that series. I mean, to be honest, I know this might sound controversial, but I think Julius Randle was an addition by subtraction. I think the fact that he wasn't playing made the Knicks better in the playoffs. And maybe the Knicks still win that series because they had the clear talent advantage. Like, I'll admit, in that series, the Knicks were the deeper, more talented team. But I think Philly's done a nice job closing that gap, adding Paul George, and the Knicks lost Hartenstein, which I don't think that could be forgotten about. I I think I'm going to respond to both. So I I do agree with Zach in that last statement that he made about addition by subtraction, because with the loss of Julius Randle came the evolution of Dante DiVincenzo because of the workload Mm -hmm. and the spacing that was around Jalen Brunson. Now, obviously you give and take because the Knicks missed that that shot creation, you know, would have been able to help pull defenders away from Jalen Brunson. So I think there's addition by subtraction, give and take, depending on your perspective. As far as the point uh, uh, that Zach made, and I kind of agree with Zay a little bit, you know, I I said on the last show, you know, I could see either side, but I tend to agree with Zay on this particular topic a little bit more, and I'm going to explain why. Now, when you talk about the 76ers and Knicks series and how you thought that they were very, very close to winning that series, Zach, why were they close? Because you had one of the main reasons is because you had Tyrese Maxey that was literally coming into his own. He already started off the year good, and he continued to ascend even in the playoffs. You know, there was games where the Knicks should have won, and it got extended to overtime because he made that clutch shot that he made. You know, he took on that role of, okay, that's a clear 
sidekick to Joel Embiid, who, by the way, was on one leg, hopping around and still being able to uh, impact the game. I think that shows that all you need is role pieces around Tyrese Maxey and Joel Embiid. When Denver won the championship um, two years ago, and the reason why I'm comparing Denver is because you have Jamal Murray, you have Jokic, you have that two-man show, and over here you have Tyrese Maxey and Embiid. You just had the surrounding and subordinating pieces around those guys, and they won the championship. I think the same thing – I'm not saying the 76ers would have won a championship, but I think you would have gave yourself a good opportunity – just allowing Tyrese Maxey to continue to ascend, which he took that step this past season. And now with Paul George being in the mix, I'm not sure if you're stunting that growth. And that's something that you want to do. This is the same cat, Daryl Murray. I'm not going to trade this guy for a prime Michael Jordan. Okay, show us that. You know, we believe in Jalen Brunson if we are talking about the Knicks, right? We didn't trade for a star. We, we trade for Mikael Bridges, a complimentary 3 and D guy, because we believe in Jalen Brunson as our number one and two. We are putting money with our mouth is. Darren Murray is not doing that. This was like a Hail Mary move to me that he felt that he needed to make, and I don't think it makes them significantly better. I think they're around the same as they were last year, if you ask me. You just can't convince me, though, that replacing Tobias Harris with Paul with Paul George isn't going to massively change well, the outlook of that team. Like Tobias well, Harris was a no a complete no show in that series. He was yeah. dropping zero point games, and now you're replacing him with a guy in Paul George. Well, I understand he's not the perfect player. He has his flaws. He deserves some criticism for years past. But again, I just thought he was going to spend the rest of his career rotting away with an irrelevant Clippers team that was getting old and really not on the verge of winning anything. And now he goes to Philadelphia. I think they're much closer. And George isn't the only move they made I really liked. I'm telling you guys, this kid, Jared McCain, I know you might not love his TikToks, but this guy's a bucket. <laughs> when he when he was 18 years, uh, 17 years old, as a he was supposed to be a high school senior, this guy came into Duke and was the best player on that team, leading them to an Elite Eight. He's, I think, the best shooter in the cool. draft. I think he's going to make a big-time impact, and uh, I love the Sixers offseason. Zach, the, re the reason why, yes, you're all right. Paul George to Tobias Harris is an upgrade. My thing is, Paul George never in his career ever took never took a back seat. Like in his career, when he moved from Indiana to OKC, he didn't take a back seat to anybody. He was still that guy. He still wanted to be the guy. Even when Westbrook was going on his tirade, Paul George still wanted to be the guy with the touches and opportunities. He went to the Clippers, same thing. He wasn't deferring to Kawhi Leonard even when Kawhi Leonard was on the court. He still wanted to be the guy on the guy the guy on the court shooting the ball doing whatever he wanted to do. I don't know if he's coming to Philly and deferring to two young guys. I don't know if he's going into Philly thinking, I'm going to be the third scoring option. I think he's going in there thinking, I'm going to take over. Like he's been doing everywhere he's been in his career. And I understand Daryl Morey's trying to, quote, unquote, help Maxie and Joel B. But to Paul George's, Paul George's mind, I just got a max contract. I'm coming here to go out there and shoot. And I'm going out there to take the last shot. Now, he still thinks this is his team. And he goes up to every location the same way. So I don't know if he comes to this location where the front office is even more dysfunctional than anywhere else that he's ever been and says, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go out there and do what I want to do. He's I think he's gonna do the same exact thing he's done everywhere else. So it's more like not a talent issue, it's more a mentality issue where he still views himself as the number one scoring option on his team. And maybe that's where we just disagree. I think at the age of 34. This move by Paul George, and I know he got the most money from Philadelphia. That's a given. Like most of the time, these guys are going to go wherever they're offered the most money. But I think the fact that he went there at the age of 34 could show like, oh, all right, maybe this guy's finally serious about winning. Like, I, again, I, I never thought he'd leave the West Coast. I thought he was either going to stay with the Clippers or go to the Warriors. And the fact that he went across the country to Philadelphia to play with MB, to play with Maxi, maybe – he matured, he's matured a little bit at the age of 34 and realizes like, okay, I, I, I've been in the wilderness since I left Indiana and the number one priority for me has to be winning a ring. And I, I, I'm making the assumption that playing under a very disciplined, well-respected coach that's won a championship in Nick Nurse could get the most out of him and, and show him like, okay, you don't need to take all the shots here. We, we got it covered. Like just play your role, help us win. And I think at this age, hopefully he matures and he's ready to do that. All right, Zach, if you want to close this out with your biggest loser, by all means. Yes, I will go with my biggest loser. And, Will, I don't know if this was the team you were referring to off the top, but this was really a no-doubter for me. I'm going to go with the Golden State Warriors as my biggest oh, loser. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. There's two, actually. There's not one. You're right. Because I was thinking about another team, but that that is right. The Golden State is right up there. Yep. All right, so let me get into it. Uh, I understand that putting the Warriors here – is not only a result of things that happened this offseason, but this really dates back 
to the fact that I feel like everything has just gone wrong for this team since they won the NBA championship in 2022 and winning that title, I think for them was the best and worst thing that could ever happen at the same time. Steph Curry finally wins his first uh, NBA finals MVP. They could prove they could win a championship without Kevin Durant. But I also think it showed us that this was really the beginning of the end. And right after they won that title, Draymond Green punches Jordan Poole in the face. And I think he did that because, well, it's really reported. Like, the Warriors were about to pay Jordan Poole, and he was making fun of Draymond, saying, oh, I'm going to get that bag. And Draymond, who was going to become a free agent the offseason, uh, that following offseason, he clearly didn't take that very well. The Warriors also paid Andrew Wiggins shortly after they won that finals because he was great in that Boston series. So they gave uh, Andrew Wiggins and Jordan Poole extensions, and then – the following year, they traded Jordan Poole for Chris Paul, and then they extended Draymond. So they won that title, and then in a year stretch after that, they paid all their guys. They paid Poole. They paid Wiggins. They paid Draymond, and they gave all of those guys these massive extensions. And then a year later, Clay Thompson, who has accomplished more than any of those guys in Golden State, goes to their front office and is like, yo, where's my contract? And given everything he's accomplished compared to those guys, putting – Myself in his shoes, I understand why he thought he deserved that deal. And the Warriors' front office was just like, nah, we're not doing that. And Clay Thompson, he didn't really take it very well. But this really goes back to Bob Myers, the GM and the architect of that dynasty, leaving the team kind of out of the blue last offseason and going to do TV at ESPN uh, this time last year. And I remember at the time, the narrative was like, oh, why would this guy leave? They just won the title. And I think the reason why he left is was because he didn't want to become the next Jerry Krause and break up the dynasty like Krause did with Michael Jordan and the Bulls. And we know how Chicago Bull fans feel about Jerry Krause right now. They're not really too fond of him. So fast forward to the present. Clay Thompson is gone. They just cut Chris Paul for nothing, which makes the Jordan Poole trade look like a salary dump. And I know they had to trade Jordan Poole after that punch, but they could have gotten a lot more back than just one year of Chris Paul. I think you could really rack up that trade of a massive uh, as a massive loss. And after missing the playoffs this past season, their big moves in free agency so far have been Kyle Anderson, DeAnthony Melton, Buddy Heald. I get they're interested in Lowry Markkinen. That's kind of the buzz. But do you really want to make a trade with Danny Ainge and the Jazz when you know most of the time you're going to have to overpay? And in most deals, Ainge is involved in. He, gets, he fleeces the other team. And my last thought here... And I said this on this very show the day after the Warriors lost to the Kings in the play-in tournament. I just think Steph Curry, at this point in his career, is faced with a very interesting decision. He, he could either uh, choose to stay loyal to the Warriors and play for one team for the rest of his career, or he could go somewhere else and compete for championships because it's, it's really impossible for him to do both right now. He has to choose a lane. Do you want to stay in Golden State? Be an all-time warrior, or do you want to go somewhere else and compete for championships? Because I think this team is nowhere close to doing that. Yeah. I mean, I think in any type of deal for Laurie Market and if you're the Warriors, I would not see a deal that goes through in which Danny Ainge doesn't get any picks and doesn't get Jonathan Kaminga as a centerpiece of a deal. Now, that's where the Warriors kind of have to discuss among themselves if they're willing to sell a guy like Jonathan Kaminga who is – getting better and better each year who could take that next leap. So that's going to be a, a very interesting proposition for the Warriors. And I do agree that they should be in the losing category here of this topic. And I'm not sure if they could have done anything really major to even not be in this, you know, conversation, you know, pick your poison, because even if they got a guy like Paul George, are we really going to come up on this show and say that they are top four team in the rest of the conference that conference being so stacked with young talent is a change of the guard. Paul George is old. He's 34 years old. Okay. And clearly last year in the playoffs to me, he lost a step. He was not moving the same. He looked a little bit slower. So it's not like that move would have made them significantly better and increased the outlook of Steph finally getting another contender around him. Like, no, it would have been the same issue. They probably just would have probably been a playing team or just right above that at best the ceiling. So at the end of the day, I'm not really sure if there was a move that they could have made to not be in this category, but it doesn't help when you lose Klay Thompson, you don't make any other significant moves to upgrade your roster, and you're continuing to balance, okay, yeah, we want to commit to Steph and do right by him, but yet play the youth movement. Nah, I don't think that's a recipe for success. 
Um, Zay, you want to respond to that real quickly? Because I do have a team that I want to bring up. If not, I could just bring this team up real quickly. Well, yeah, I think I, I said it before. I, think, I just think the Warriors don't have a clear direction. Like, you, if you're going to go young, trade Curry and trade Draymond. If you're going to go old, uh, if you're going to stick with the players, then you you resign Clay. You keep running it out till the tires blow out. I just don't understand that you, you wind up letting Clay walk, but you still want to retain Steph Curry and Draymond Green. Like, clearly, you're not trying to be competitive. Like, there's no other players available in this free agency that would put you in that competitive situation in that Western Conference. Then we might as well just trade Curry, trade Draymond, allow them to try to continue their aspirations to win another championship elsewhere. You recoup assets, you recoup young players, and you hope that um you you kind of hit on free on on, on a draft one of these years. But I, I just think it was a um it just didn't make sense to me. So I, clearly, the Warriors are losers because they have no clear direction of where they're trying to go. Fellas, I would like to end here with this team because I think this team right here, when you really look at it, and they're a loser, but when you look at some of the little moves that they made, they actually did okay in those regards. For example, they signed Mo Bamba, who was going to be a guy that could space the floor, that could work in a Kawhi, James Harden-style offense. You know where I'm going here, the Clippers, obviously. And it gives you a depth piece behind Zubak, which is an upgrade, excuse me, over Mason Pumley. And I think that's a good pickup right there. Um, I also think Batum is solid, bringing him back. And also, there's one person I'm missing here, Derrick Jones, one of the best defenders on Dallas. You actually stole the best defender from Dallas to your team. So I think those three moves are a little bit underrated as far as together. But they have to be a loser to me based on how they handled the Paul George situation. Because there was a point in time a couple of years ago when they could have sell high on poor George and got out of that mess and got some value back, and they didn't. They decide to prioritize selling tickets. Obviously, they have a new stadium that they are going to play in next year, and they want to sell tickets. And when you have that mindset, ask Brooklyn, when you're trying to sell tickets, let's bring in Kevin Durant, let's bring in Kyrie Irving, let's trade for KG uh, and um, Paul Pierce. Yeah, you know what happens when you prioritize selling tickets. You sell your soul and you mess up your, your future. And I think that's what the Clippers in some regards are doing here. And, yes, they gave Kawhi that contract. I think it was a three-year deal. And Paul George, we all know that situation. He won the four-year deal. But the fact that they didn't trade him, the fact that the Warriors offered them a package and they just allowed him to walk for nothing, I think the way how they handled that, plus what they gave up to get Paul George in the first place, signifies to me that the Dunder clearly won that trade. So although they made some, you know, underrated moves, I still think the way how they handled the Paul George situation is why they have to be a loser for me. Any thoughts on, on the Clippers or are we going to head to halftime here? I think I 100% agree with you in terms of the Clippers. Similar to the Warriors, there's no clear direction. Um, you're not recouping assets. I thought if you would have traded him to Golden State, you would have re recouped a lot of assets. I said this on the show before. I think Moses Moody and Jonathan Kaminga are solid players. They were solid college players. They both are really above average defenders. I think you, you bring them onto the Clippers. You didn't have to keep Chris Paul. You could have waved them. You could have done whatever. The same thing the Warriors did. Um, you brought you was also going to bring in an Andrew Wiggins plus a draft pick. I don't understand why you say no to that. That, that is your if you have players there, you have Andrew Wiggins who you can utilize down the road, and you said no. Like I'm I'm just confused on what they thought was gonna happen. Even if Paul George goes to the Warriors with Curry and Draymond, that's not a championship winning team. Like and, and just I just don't understand where their mindset is in terms of what they want to get done. Um Clippers and, and the Warriors, I just don't understand them. Please like and subscribe for all the up to date content. We're, we, you've been slinging shows left and right, slinging content left and right. Please don't miss anything. If you do, like, subscribe, leave a comment, or leave a question, something you may want to answer, something you may have. It's, all ideas are great ideas. Nothing's a dumb question. 